Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at the Reynolds Transport Theorem and applying it to the energy equation. So as before, we're going to be looking at some control volume, but instead of mass or momentum, we're going to be looking at the energy inside of that control volume. Now, Reynolds Transport says that we can take the material derivative of any quantity and use that in order to write an equation with the partial derivative. So the total derivative of energy is based on how much energy is being gained or lost by the fluid as it moves through. So instead of looking at the control volume, we're looking at the fluid itself. And all that can happen to that fluid is heat flow to or from the fluid, or work to or from the fluid. So we can look at the net heat flow, as well as the net work done to the fluid. And the heat flow is pretty straightforward, um, pretty standard. Uh, heat flows due to a temperature imbalance. So if we have a much hotter surface that we're flowing next to, then heat is going to flow from the hot surface into our fluid, and vice versa. The work that's being done can be done by a couple of different sources. The first of which, which occurs in any sort of problem where we have fluid flowing, is going to be pressure work. And the second is work due to pumps or turbines or things like that. And we typically call this shaft work. So this is going to be the form of our equation. Uh, to start off, we really need to think about what energy can be. The first thing is just energy due to heat within the fluid. And we typically call that internal energy. And that can be written as just U. And U is typically some specific heat multiplied by some temperature. And U by itself is usually in units of joules per kilogram. So we usually, or we have been doing everything so that we end up with our quantities per unit volume. So in order to get there, we just multiply by rho. Next, we can also think about kinetic energy. And we've been talking about this since physics. It's just mass multiplied by velocity squared over 2. But instead of mass, we're going to be using rho. Then we can think about potential energy. And I can just write that as rho times g times h. And the list could go on. We could think about chemical energy. We could think about nuclear energy. And so on and so forth. We're not going to include these just because we're not going to see any problems with them in this video series. Potential energy is useful whenever we're talking about water, but if we're talking about air, usually we neglect this. Internal energy and kinetic energy are almost always useful. Likewise, if we're talking about water, we usually neglect the internal energy because the temperature of the water is very rarely changing significantly. In both cases, though, we're going to be using kinetic energy. So let's write this out using Reynolds Transport Theorem. So we will say that the partial derivative with respect to time of all of the energy in our control volume plus all of the energy going in and out of our control volume is going to be equal to this Q dot that's coming in, so this is our heat flow, plus the work done by pressure, plus the work done by any shafts that we have. So that would be any pumps or turbines or compressors or anything else. So our goal now is to go ahead and write these in terms that are simpler. We really can't do much at this point with the shaft work, so we're just going to leave it alone. But we can simplify both our q dot n and our work due to pressure. So q dot n, if instead of heat flow, we think of heat flux, so q being the heat flux, which is simply the heat flow per unit area, so that would be in watts per meter squared, typically. Well, 
this heat flow in would just be an integral over our entire surface of all of the heat flux that's being pointed inward. So we can write this q dot in as the integral over our entire surface of this q dotted with our normal. Now remember that our normal is defined as pointing outward. So if we have q in the direction of the normal, that's actually going out. So we need to put a negative sign here so that we're tracking the energy coming in. OK, now let's think about the work done by pressure. Work is simply force multiplied by some distance. So let's zoom in to some very small portion of our surface and look at the work that's being done by pressure there. So first off, we're trying to calculate a DF, which is going to be the pressure on this surface. We know the direction due to the normal pointing outward. So our DF is simply going to be our pressure multiplied by our normal direction to give us a direction and that multiplied by our ds, our differential surface area. Now this is actually pointing outward once again, so we need to have a negative sign here. Okay, so now what's our distance? What distance is our fluid moving? Well, we can think of this entire thing as moving some distance into our control volume, right? So this distance is simply equal to the velocity multiplied by some time that passes. So what do we end up with? If we think about some differential, some tiny piece of our total work coming in, then this is going to be equal to this differential force that's occurring multiplied by our distance. So this is going to be negative P in dotted with our velocity times a delta T and all of that multiplied by the surface area. But of course, we're interested in the rate of work, not the work being done over some period of time. So we can come up with the rate of work due to pressure as the integral over our entire surface of this differential work that we just came up with. So let's include that negative sign. And we'll have pressure multiplied by our velocity dotted with our normal vector, and all of that multiplied by ds. So let's write all this out. And like we said before, we're just leaving this shaft work alone, and we're only expanding the heat flux and the work done by pressure. Now, we can actually simplify this a little bit by recognizing that this integral here has essentially the same form as the second integral on the left-hand side. So we can move this over to the left-hand side to get this basically as simple as we can manage. So let's go ahead and do that really quickly. So we've gotten rid of this term on the right-hand side and moved it into this just list of different types of energy. So now we have u plus p divided by rho. Now, if we're talking about a gas and we're using the ideal gas equation, we know that p is just equal to rho rt. And so p divided by rho is just rt. And if you remember from thermodynamics, u plus rt is simply equal to h, or the enthalpy. Now, if we're talking about a liquid, then this doesn't work, and we really just need to leave it in exactly the form that it has. So this is our final form of the energy equation. A lot of the time, we will be crossing a lot of these terms out and just looking at specific things. Sometimes we won't have any heat flux, so we just completely get rid of this term. Sometimes there are no shafts, so we just get rid of this term. But otherwise, these are the terms that we will be using in order to solve problems that require the tracking of energy.